All right, thank you so much, Herman. Uh, our final speaker of the day is excited to get started here and uh, said he doesn't need an introduction, uh, but you can certainly find his bio in your packet there with you today. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, give me a hand, uh, help uh, introducing Nicholas Kinney. Thanks. I'm a little shorter. Good afternoon. So I'm Nick Kenny. I'm uh, an engineer. Most of my work is related to irrigation and production systems, some background work in wells and water development, etc. I've been doing work for the last couple of years with the North Plains Groundwater Conservation District out of Dumas, uh, working on production systems in the Texas North Plains. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about what the focus has been, and if you listen to Jordan Bell's discussions, she uh, got to specifics on one portion of it. We're going to dig into some of the other specifics and the impetus of the value of a corn cotton rotation in the Texas North Plains. Some unique pieces about it, why it's unique, but why we think it's a great fit. So to begin, here's just the background of what we've got going on. In the North Plains Groundwater Conservation District, it covers the upper uh, eight northernmost counties in the state of Texas and there is a water conservation center that's a research demonstration uh, expose type facility just outside of Eder that's got two center pivots and two moderate sized drip plots where we can take rapidly some ideas what we think is going to be useful play them out on the field at large farm scale operation scale and then overlay some research components over that based on best management practices with the premise being that we can demonstrate the best methods to be most cost effective, conservation minded with the water and still remain productive in, a, in an agricultural system. The reason this is important is in that part of the world, 90% of the water goes to agriculture. So when we start talking about the value of what an inch or what a marginal change is in water consumption, we are going to do it in agriculture. So this setting may not be specifically for ag producers, but those that are water users need to be cognizant of the efforts that are taking place within these ag environments, that there truly is conservation that's happening. There's improved economies, there's improved economics, and there are some very specific and timely cutting edge processes that are de being developed right in this neighborhood. So I want to note who cooperates at this water conservation center, which is the demonstration center for the district. Uh, we've got a, a manager on site, Curtis Schwartner, who's the resource specialist. We have a farmer cooperator who takes this in as part of his program. He farms about 2,000 acres, of which these couple hundred acres at the Water Conservation Center are part of his, his strategy and operation that's been Stan Spain for the last couple of years. Uh, the direction that the farm takes is based on the mind and will of the Board of Directors for the North Plains Groundwater Conservation District and namely from the inputs of the Ag Committee that is specifically targeting things that we can do to be uh, more effective with managing water in ag settings. We cooperate with Texas A&M AgriLife, most recently with Dr. Bell, David Reinert with Better Harvest, Adam Ford who's been a crop consultant whose experience and history working on this cutting edge that we're working on has been just uh, imperative. And then of course all the North Plains Groundwater Conservation District staff. I want to make a note with that one of the, th there's a handful of key points that this demonstration effort requires, and one of that is to have timely and specific and entertaining extension and outreach type uh, delivery of materials. So we've relied on the North Plains Groundwater Conservation District staff to truly put out videos consistently. They hit Twitter, Instagram, Face Space, all of these goofy things that I refuse to go on, but they do a tremendous job of getting the word out but the reach is, is fantastic. I will say that most of our farmers now that we deliver to are active on social media, are very active on YouTube. We've put together field days that are virtual field days rather than on-site field days at the rec recommendation of the Ag Committee. And it's been a great way to get information out. The idea here is that if we can come up with something unique, present it, show that it's feasible at a large scale immediately, within the cycle of a year, it can be implemented in the field. And we're seeing that happening consistently over and over to the point that um, 
We have many of the producers within the district that are now coming back to the effort that's taken place within the Water Conservation Center to say, how is this going to shape my next year's cropping pattern? What things do I need to be looking at? So I think that's an accomplishment. I think that's a, a good point that I, I'm glad and, and proud of the Water Conservation District, uh, the North Plains Groundwater Conservation District for uh, striving to make as part of their, their program and protocol. Here's the layout of the farm in 2019. If you were to look on the, it's basically laying out facing on the, the, the Cartesian coordinates where that's going to be the west side over there. So on the west side we had a pivot of uh, cotton, on the east side we had a pivot of corn. The north plot of drip in 2019 was corn, the south plot was cotton. And we ended up with a handful of studies that were overlaid on this. From the outside it looked like a, a farm, which it is, but overlaid with that we were able to have some replicated plots of very large scale so that we can truly tease out some differences between some treatments and find what's most efficacious. On the cotton pivot, we looked at cotton population. Uh, some reasons for that, if you recall what Dr. Bell was talking about, notice that when we are limited for heat units and we have a short cotton production season, if we can preferentially grow first position bulls, which means the more early maturing cotton, take that to full maturity, then the quality of the cotton can go up and the yield of cotton can go up. So we looked at some population studies to see if that through population we could truly manipulate um, yield as well as quality benefits by, by planting higher populations or whether cotton could truly be managed as a low input cotton was be crop and best used uh, as a way to, to keep costs down with lower populations. On our uh, west side of the west pivot, there is a cover crop study that is initiated by Texas A&M AgriLife. The idea being there is that if we want to look at soil health and a continuation of soil health, we need to start looking at off-season live activity going on in the, the soil. The debate there, of course, has been in an arid and semi-arid environment, in order to grow an off-season crop, it's going to require some water, whether that be that timely precipitation in that off-season, whether it be applied irrigation, it's going to have a water cost to it. So we're trying to figure out the pluses and minuses of that and truly weigh that balance. Get away from speculation and find answers on whether a cover crop system is something that's going to be pertinent in the semi-arid environment. On the east side of the farm, to reinstate, that's where our corn uh, project was. Essentially what we had done there was incorporated best management water practices across the circle of the corn. We planted four different hybrids from four different seed companies in essence to replicate what a grower may be doing in, uh, in his own field. So if a guy says, I'm a pioneer farmer, you don't have a pioneer seed, then this doesn't match me. The idea is that each person can look at that particular plot and say, yeah, this does match me. I'm willing to incorporate these management strategies in order to uh, uh, best my system. Some things I want to note about this, since this is farm scale and field scale, these are large equipment plots. They're installed with commercial size equipment, they're harvested with commercial size equipment. That's important. The other thing that we have made a point to is to use standard operating practices to be best management practices. So you'll see that the yields on this demonstration plot are at or better than the grower standard in the area. I think that is something that's of great credential to what we're trying to do here. It's hard to convince somebody to make a change if they look at that and say, well, you're telling me this, but your yield's 50 bushels off of mine. How can I take your word on any of these things if you can't even match the yield? We've consistently at the Water Conservation Center been able to match your best yields, certainly be in the range through the management practices. You can see this is a little bit of a, being a, a demonstration plot, this is a little different than what traditional research would be, but I think it fits the niche for now. It doesn't have a 20-year life cycle be, be between times of inception to something being ready. We're processing information and delivering it immediately so that if there is something of value, it can be put in place right now so that we can save the water or make the water more profitable while that unit of water is still present. So I'm going to start off going with a bit of a summary of our corn pivot, and then we'll do some comparisons between corn and cotton, both on economics and on water consumption. So if you look at the layout, this is the east pivot. You can see that the, the grower standard there is a Dynagro variety. It's 58 uh, VC37, and that is because that's what Stan likes to grow. It's what he grows across most of his, his farms. There's also a Pioneer, a Northup King, and then a, a 
a channel hybrid that's in there. And here's the summary. So now you're going to have to squint. I'm going to test your eyesight. We've got on this chart, and I wish I had a pointer, but you can follow me. I'll work from, uh, from left to right on it. Okay. We had two different treatments in our corn project. The north half of the pivot was fertilized one way based on a 250 bushel yield goal. The south half of the pivot was fertilized based on a 230 bushel per acre yield goal. Split applications, the only changes in fertilizer was the amount based on recommendations from a yield goal. And so we'll see that there's a, a little bit more fertilizer essentially applied on the north side. The timing of those fertili fertilizer applications was split. There was some that was applied as late as, as post-tassel. Um, if we look at the third column, or excuse me, the fourth column, that's where I want you to start paying attention. There's a bushels per acre column, and you start to see that there is yields in the range of 240 to 250 on the north side, yields generally in the range of 230 to 240 on the south side. This is why this is important. We didn't change water application. We didn't change hybrids. Instead, we compared those side to side. And by using a more accurate fertilizer input based on what our, our yield potentials were and matching that, the point that I want to draw to now is all the way to the far right end of the scale or the right end of the chart, which is our water use efficiency. Okay, so keep in mind the categories and then look at what our, our key indicator is, that water use efficiency. Water use efficiency, I think, is our best measure and it's going to be our driver going forward in terms of figuring out if our production systems are useful. This water use efficiency number incorporates all of the water that the, the crop had taken, so irrigation water, soil water, and in-season rainfall. And then it uh, uh, uses that number to divide the yield by, so it's bushels per acre inch is the units on it. It's a bit of a misnomer. For those that are criticizing the thought of water use efficiency, it's not necessarily an efficiency because it's not unitless. It's got actual units, but those units are well categorized. It's yield per water, and that can transition from field, location, crop, etc. And so what we're seeing is that on our higher fertility rate plots, uh, the north half of the pivot essentially, we have water use efficiencies that are cresting over 7.5 bushels per acre inch, and some one particular plot that's over eight bushels per acre inch. Now, why is this important? When we did our EPIC project, when we did the AgriPartners project, the 12200 project, in all of those, it was common to see six and a half bushels per acre inch as the standard number. We had one outlier at one point that approached eight bushels per acre inch. But now we've seen across multiple different production uh, scenarios within the same pivot that we excelled past seven and a half as our standard for uh, yield per unit water. So when we talk about what affects bottom line and affects that principle of every drop counts, this is making the best out of each incremental unit of water. And it's essentially through management, but it's also through all of the processes of management coming up. Selecting the right hybrids definitely makes a difference when you plant. This is late planted corn. Uh, it definitely makes a difference what your fertility does. As you notice, the north side versus the south side, if you just glance at it, we got a bump of about 0.5 bushels per acre inch on the north half versus the south half. So we're going to talk about making the most value of our water. All of these incremental inputs really matter. But one of the points that I want to make is probably the one that I'm most proud of in the North Plains is that a rising tide raises all ships. And as we've looked at that, and as we've paid attention to that, I have seen yields maintain while water consumption has consistently gone down on corn. So what's that done? That's consistently spread the gap of our water use efficiency and consistently increased the gap on relative profitability. Certainly that doesn't say profitability completely because we're not talking about you know, a, a stable or consistently increasing corn price or energy price, but the gap is changing because our water use efficiency is going up. To me, that's a big mark of success that wouldn't happen if we weren't paying attention to these nuances and details with, with corn especially. We also had uh, some drip uh, corn, similar numbers. Um, we're going to continue looking at comparisons between drip and pivot on, on corn especially. We transition into cotton, and I want to 
see if you can start drawing some of these parallels as to why this is important and why cotton has a place, I think, to stay in the North Plains as it's gone up there. Some differences in, in cotton. On our corn, we had to apply 19 inches of irrigation water. Excuse me, on our corn, that was 19 inches. On our cotton, we applied 9 inches. And I think uh, we got a little greedy towards the end of the year, actually. I think our effective application was more in the range of, of 8 inches. We applied one last 1-inch one irrigation in September. We broke the cardinal rule of irrigating cotton in the North Plains. We irrigated after the 1st of September on the premise that we thought we'd have a warm, uh, a, 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 a hopeful premise that we would have a warm late fall. We ended up having a frost on the 11th of October that ended that. Um, it didn't hurt us any, except for that we pumped a little extra water for it, which damaged our water use efficiency. We paid money for that water, etc. cetera. Uh, I wanna draw your attention to some of the, the, the numbers that are on this chart and strike a difference between the corn and the cotton so you can understand. On our corn, we delegated four gallons per minute per acre as our capacity. On our cotton, we looked at a uh, imposed three gallons per minute per acre capacity. On our corn, we irrigated for approximately 90 days. On our cotton, we irrigated for approximately 60 days. So when you start to see the difference in how you can manage these on a systematic basis, we could get by with one gallon per minute per acre less on the cotton for capacity, and we can irrigate it for roughly two-thirds of the time. And so that adds up to a big chunk. That adds up to 10 inches difference in application for what we considered full irrigation on corn and full irrigation on, on cotton. And to reiterate, on our cotton, we, we ended up applying nine and a quarter inches um, under the pivot. So I'm gonna advance the slide to some more data. And there's some telling data in here. There's a lot to extract. We could probably, if you're interested individually, look at each one of these for, uh, for an hour and discuss the nuance. But the things that I want to point out is this. What we found is that our higher population cotton plantings, uh, for one thing, didn't end up being higher actual stands this year. We had a hugely diminished stand count primarily because we planted the first week of May. This cotton was planted the 6th of May, and then a cold front came on for uh, the entire month of May and halfway through June. And so we were, we were diminished on our stand. If you look at this chart, again, working from uh, left to right, you can see that there's a, a stand column heading with an actual population and the, the percent of what was planted. And you can see that we have, in many cases, a mid-50s percentage of what was planted. So, for instance, where we planted 110,000 seeds, we had a population of 63,000. Okay, what we were shooting for was an ultra-high population so we could test our hypothesis about uh, setting first position bowls rather than late position bowls. And there's a lot that we'll get into with, with that at a later date. Um, what we ended up with, though, is we shifted the whole spectrum down. So we still have this break in population, but instead of being all the way at the high end, 110,000 coming down, we basically got back to a normal front where we were looking at 65,000 coming down to roughly 22,000, which is a normal range. We will repeat this study in subsequent years, namely this year, with the idea that we would like to see what cotton does when it's truly got 110 uh, plants out there to, to see if we can, one, control late season runaway, and two, see if we can prioritize and set first position bowls as the priority, then with confidence, shut off the cotton crop in September and then harvest early and be out of there and be happy with our results. That's the premise, that's the thought. Okay, so I want you to point out here is the, the purple highlighted area is all of our replications based on the loan value. Some things that we saw based on this quality number was that generally speaking, the higher populations had a better quality cotton. In, in this year's application. Okay, so that premise of moving towards first position bowls does seem to have some premise in, in influencing quality by higher populations. These are the same exact numbers, just uh, ranked differently. They're ranked based on total revenue uh, on the far side. And I want you to consider these numbers because these numbers become very important into the relationship of why we're looking at a cotton and corn rotation. These numbers are substantially higher than many of the rotational crops that have historically been used in the North Plains. So it's typically been, I can make a lot of money with corn potentially, and I can break even on these other crops, but I've got to have rotation. 
The idea being here is if we have a corn and cotton rotation where there's enough margin between it and we can figure out these production systems suitably, then we can have back-to-back -back profitable years with crops that are symbiotic, with crops that are different. Looking at a cotton crop, which is a broadleaf crop, tap-rooted, versus a corn crop, which is a grass crop that's fibrous-rooted. Looking at some better, improved, uh, better and improved disease resistance in the soil, looking at better control for volunteers, better control for weeds, et cetera, et cetera. Truly getting into a rotation that's not only equitable, but better for what we're trying to accomplish in, in sustainability and in, in farming in the North Plains. So those numbers, again, I, I don't want to put a whole lot of weight on these because this was not the best cotton year ever. But I will say, we were cresting over three bales per acre on what was a poor cotton year. It wasn't but five years ago or so in the Texas North Plains that we would be doing backflips to see three bales per acre cotton. Part of our problem was last year on these same fields, we saw over five bales per acre. So our, our, our temperance is being adjusted as we're fine-tuning what a cotton season is and is not. This next chart is really interesting. This is a comparison between 2018 and 2019. Uh, growing degree days. Now, I will say that we are working on this. We are working on some details to try to find a better fit for semi-arid and uh, heat-limited environments, namely the North Plains, to see what a, a growing degree day consideration actually is. But these numbers are yet comparable. The orange line on the top is our growing degree days accumulated from the 1st of May in 2018. Our line on the, the intermediate line there, the blue line, is the 2019 uh, cotton growing degree days. <clears throat> okay, now for those that aren't familiar, growing degree days, it's a measure of temperatures that essentially allows you to create a model so that you can relate what, what crop growth is based on the temperature as it accumulates throughout the year. So many units of heat will allow it to progress to a certain growth stage, etc. Some things that are interesting, and I want you to look now at this bottom line, this gray line. This gray line is the difference between the two. Okay, this is one of those slides that we can get into a lot of detail about, but by the end of June in 2019, we were approximately 400 heat units behind where we were compared to 2018 on heat units. Now that makes a big difference by the end of June for this reason. 400 heat units is a 50% departure from the year before. So there's a couple things to consider with this. We got off to an incredibly slow start in cotton. We planted, and then we knew that there was a cold front coming and a wet front coming, and we planted anyway. The result region-wide was that many farmers went, went in and terminated their cotton crop, either collected insurance or on their own cost terminated it, went back with a grain crop, a, a later season grain crop. Uh, some went in, and because their stand was so poor, augmented by planting to get more cotton out there. We stuck with it at the center because we figured if anybody's going to do this and if we need to find some results of what a non-cotton year looks like, it needs to be us, and so we stuck with it. The outcome is that we still had two and a half to three bale cotton on a non-cotton year, and I think that's great because we were still equitable in a marginal year. When you can look at a break-even on that and then compare it to the year before when there was a lot of opportunity, uh, cotton does seem to me like it's here to stay. Some other things that are important to look at, if you look at that bottom gray line, and I hope you can track with me, I'm finger pointing in the air, but as the line comes down, what that's indicating is that after we had this very slow, cold start, we caught up quickly. And by the end of the growing season, we were approximately 100 heat units behind what 2019 was. Okay, so we started off cold, then we got intense heat. I'd like to talk more of, about that with corn, but certainly within the realm of cotton, that makes a difference. And that's what led us to think, if there's ever a year to try to push this late, let's push this late. And we did. We applied a late irrigation in September and then didn't get the benefit of it because it dropped off cold. A point I want to make also, <clears throat> if you look at that 28th September line going up and you look at the orange chart, that was the, uh, the uh, 2018 chart. And usually you get a dip in temperature in mid-September where it starts to come down and cool off. In 2019, we did not have that. I tend to think that some of the late planted grain, especially the corn in the area, if it was indeed able to follow this chart through and 2019 followed a more 
consistent trend, we would have seen even higher yields on our corn. But that, cold, that, that warm mid to late September during grain fill ended up damaging our, our corn yields marginally. So what does all this mean? This is 2018. We're looking at a cotton versus corn comparison. Okay, if we look at this chart, we've got a yield. We've got the unit price, dollars per bushel, or the dollars per, per pound loan value. And we're comparing cotton versus corn here at the Water Conservation Center. This top line going across the top was our best performing variety in 2018 of corn. The cotton on the bottom, so the, the 12 or so entries on the bottom, those indicate all of the, uh, the cotton on the farm. And what I want you to notice is that if we were to take this all the way to the end, combine it with a budget, combine it with water applied, etc., and look at the final indicator of revenue per inch of irrigation, this is why we get excited about cotton in this area. And this is what Jordan was pinpointing, and this is what we're really looking at to see if this is sustainable long term. We see that cotton in every instance in 2018 had a preferential dollar figure of, of, of revenues per acre inch applied to the tune of 2x two two in some cases. Okay, so when we talk about valuing our water and marketing our water through a crop, this is the matrix that we need to be looking at. This is why corn is good because corn is yet better than sorghum and wheat on this. And now we see that when we add cotton to the mix, cotton is actually going to provide some benefit there as well. So you're going to say, well, this was a, a cotton year. Of course, it's going to be better for cotton. What does it look like in 2019? Well, in 2019, I took our highest and lowest revenue generating plots for both the corn and the cotton. Again, the corn is on top and the cotton is on the bottom and the numbers hold pretty similarly. Our poorest cotton was still a little bit better than our best corn in terms of revenue per inch of water applied. I think this is an important indice. My argument here is not one versus the other because I don't think that's the argument at all. My opinion is we won't be successful with cotton in the North Plains if we turned into a monoculture. I think that's a horrible move to do that. But I think when you combine it with a grain crop and cotton, we can be very successful. It makes for an annual year to year to year uh, profitable rotation. And to the point being is that if we were to try to match this by growing corn on corn consistently, uh, we would not prolong the, the length of the aquifer the way that we will if we throw cotton in there and spread that out by irrigating less in those off seasons where we're not growing corn. <clears throat> this, uh, I'm going to skip over this. That's for uh, costs for Many producers, we'll come back to that. The comparison there is that the operating costs are similar. Cotton's a little more expensive to grow. The other thing that we did this last year, based off of our uh, pushback from the previous year's study, was try to allocate truly how much water is being extracted from the soil by cotton that corn could not, would not, or does not need to extract. The premise being there is that these aggrandized numbers that favor cotton in terms of water use may be missing a piece of the puzzle by what cotton is grabbing from either deeper soil water levels or by pulling harder on the soil aggregate to bring soil water in. The idea was we would now dig some pits, pre-plant and post-harvest, do a gravimetric sampling at each incremental foot and determine for sure what the water consumption was for corn and for cotton on the center. And so here's our results from that. To get your bearings on this, what we've got here is a, looking at both of our pivots. So if you remember, the west pivot was cotton the year before it was corn. The east pivot was corn the year before cotton. Okay, so this top line here is looking at the west pivot, which is cotton in 2019. Let's see if I got some highlighted stuff. I might. No, darn it. Okay, so track with me here. Uh, if you look at this west pivot portion where it says plant available water and you go all the way down to the bottom of that, you'll see a number that says 12.23 inches. So essentially 12 and a quarter inches. That's how much water was available in the soil for the cotton left by the corn from the previous year to an eight foot depth. So we're saying to an eight foot profile, we've got 12 and a quarter inches. All right. If you track down to the next graphic, follow that same column down, and we look now what was available to start the corn season following a cotton season on the east pivot, 
you can see that we have 4.6 inches. So immediately there's an indicator that says we had a lot more water left in our crop following corn than we did following cotton. Okay, and that was our pre-plant numbers. Uh, went through the season, got our rainfall. We actually got some beneficial rainfall prior to the corn being planted after we took these measurements. That's the same rainfall that fell on the, the cotton that, that damaged that stand a little bit. Uh, we went through all of our irrigation as needed, best management practices, etc. Measured the water extraction at the end of the year and then went and dug again immediately following harvest. And that's what we've got on the, the center graphic. Okay, so if we look there, we've got at the end of the season, plant available water post-harvest. In the cotton ground where we started with 12 and a quarter inches, we ended up with six and a quarter inches for a, a net extraction there of six inches from the soil based on our, our cotton crop, the way we managed it. When we look at the same scenario for our corn crop, where we started with 4.6, we ended up with 8.48, or basically eight and a half inches. Okay, so we gained water by refilling the profile and managing for our corn crop. This doesn't sound all that dramatic until you realize the directions we're going. The corn's gaining, the cotton's dropping. The difference is when you combine the two. This kind of comes full circle to our irrigation management. The difference between the two on our soil water extraction is 10 inches. And the difference of what we applied to the crops essentially was 10 inches. So the question still begs. Is cotton really more water use efficient? Or are we partitioning water that we've paid for in the corn and getting the benefit of it in the cotton? In my opinion, that only really mad matters for a budgetary reason, and we will work out those details. But the benefit of having these systems being different in timing, different in application needs during the season, different in capacity needs, different in planting times, gives us the benefit, essentially, to over the course of two crops, save what would be 10 inches of pumped water to get the benefit of the same economic potential on each field. Now here's my premise on this and what I think is happening. I think cotton is much more aggressive in the soil at extracting water than corn ever could be. It goes to depth, certainly. We can see that on these numbers. It extracted water aggressively through five feet, and I presume if we dried it out enough, it would draw water down through and to that eight-foot level, whether it's actively extracting it or whether it's creating enough of a void in the upper levels for capillary action to bring it up. It's really indifferent. It can use water from depth. That's one. The other is I think cotton shows to be very aggressive going laterally for water that corn just doesn't. If you think of the plant as a pump, think of the corn only being able to extract so much but the cotton having much more horsepower, able to exert more vacuum on the soil to pull that last little bit of water. I think that's helpful in this symbiotic relationship. The reason being is we were never hurting for water on our corn crop following the cotton because of off-season precipitation, which refilled these voids, and because of in-season pre precipitation, which was early, which again refilled those voids. I can assure you that with the rainfall that we had last year, we lost a little bit of water on the crop following corn based on deep percolation and likely some localized runoff. I think we didn't have that effect where we had more and larger voids following our, our cotton crop. So we want to capture every bit of local rainfall. This is a good part of the rotation. If we want to make the best use of water that corn never could extract, well then we put a more aggressive crop in there as a rotation. That's exactly what cotton does. A couple points that uh, I was interested to find in this is this is what opened my eyes to the fact that a cotton-on-cotton -cotton rotation, although it may be feasible, is not going to be a water-saving venture because at some point you're going to have to pump that water back into the soil or refill it adequately so that the cotton can get the benefit out of it. What I think the best thing to do is, is do that in the process of growing a valuable corn crop and then allow the cotton to come in, mind the difference, and then rotate back. That's my premise on this. We will continue to look at these corn and cotton rotations, but it's my opinion that it's here to stay. And the more nuance we find out of it, the more that we tease out of this in terms of solar radiation, heat units, day length, planting dates, etc., we'll start to see cotton be a very reliable piece of the production system uh, in the Texas North Plains. I'm going to end with this slide up. 
This is our proposal for our 2020 studies. Again, it's a flip-flop, so we'll change locations, change the fields, and again, insinuate this rotation back and forth in a controlled environment, truly demonstrating that this is a feasible and, and, and note, noteworthy and, and worthwhile production. So I will close with that, and I will take comments and questions as available. Yes, CE. Good question. So those, those are on 30s. All of it was on 30s based on, one, what equipment was available, and two, the fact that that's what we had for, for the corn. If we want to drive populations up in cotton, we're going to have to look at shorter row space. And the guys that have been successful that way have, have looked at more uh, equidistance between crops laterally and along the row length just to get better sunlight capture. Thank you. Excellent. I'll be done. Y'all have a great afternoon.